talk about the schedule for the 2024 Arizona Cardinals season. We'll pick every game and give our predictions for the upcoming season. We'll also discuss the lackluster schedule release video the team produced. The New York Times ranked all of them, and it came in dead last. Lastly, we'll talk about some fantasy football implications of the schedule and predict the outcomes for the Cardinals in fantasy this year. All of this and more starts right now on Cardinals Uncovered. All right, I'm Andrew Nordmeyer. I'm going to dive into the schedule with the Cardinals will be facing this season, starting with a shuffle off to Buffalo and ending with a divisional game here in the desert against the arch-rival 49ers. But first, let's talk about that video the Cardinals released for the upcoming season announcing their schedule. And, you know, when I look at it, I wasn't really a fan of it. Now, don't get me wrong. The three artists who contributed to the mural did an amazing, did amazing work and have a lot of talent, but it fell flat for me in the overall product, especially compared to the other team's offerings. I took a screenshot of it here at the end, and I found it very hard to follow which way to read the various teams they put on the mural, and couldn't tell should I read across each line to the right, or go up and down and to the right. Made a little bit confusing, and I couldn't tell, you know, do we play the Chargers fourth, or do we play them seventh? I had no idea until I actually saw the actual schedule, so the mural kind of falls short for me in that regard. Um, you basically had a, the schedule was only on the screen for a couple seconds. So you had to pause it like I did here with the screen capture to see what it actually was. And then the other issue you've got here is that it came out about 45 minutes late. So we didn't get to see it and it got lost behind all the other ones. I found myself trying to get all the references in the Chargers video that he did style in the Sims and found the Ferris Bueller's Day Off send up the Bears did to be solid and completely overlooked the Cardinals video because it came out at 545 for whatever reason. The last thing I'll say about it is that the window in the middle of the mural just really threw the whole thing off. It stood out for all the wrong reasons. It was frankly kind of an eyesore. It would have looked a lot better had the mural been done on a more solid wall where the look wouldn't have been interrupted by the window. It just seems so weird to have it sitting right there in the middle and just like I said, it throws the entire vibe off, throws everything off, makes it all look awkward. Very, very strange indeed, but that's what they gave us, and that's what we have. All right, enough about that. Let's talk about the schedule for the 2024 season. I'm going to grab my crystal ball here and take this on four games at a time. We'll predict the wins and losses for each block of the season, starting with the first four games. So what we've got here, I'll just throw up the old lo everyone's logo on the screen. There we go. First four of the upcoming season start with a visit to Josh Allen, the Buffalo Bills, before three consecutive home dates with the L.A. Rams, Detroit Lions, and Washington Commanders in that order. Off the cuff, I'm not terribly thrilled about three consecutive home games in September, even when it's a season where Arizona plays nine home games due to the annual flip-flop. So let's start breaking them down. Game one at Buffalo, it's no secret that Stephon Diggs is gone and the Bills receiving corps has questions. We know rookie Keon Coleman will answer them and entertain us, but Buffalo has question marks on both sides of the ball. What the game comes down to is if Bills quarterback Josh Allen starts the season with a solid game or if he tries to force uh, balls deep to make passes. You know, I think Allen does have a solid day with at least three total touchdowns because, hey, the guy can run too. And the Cardinals wind up getting smashed through a table on opening weekend and fall on Buffalo. Second game they take on the Rams, and it's going to be a really good test for the new cornerbacks in Sean Murphy Bunning and rookie Max Melton as they take with Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua, last year's leading rookie wide receiver. I give a slight advantage to James Conner in the battle of the running backs, but I think Kyler Murray outduels Matthew Stafford in week two. Arizona snags a divisional win, and they start at 1-1, one one, so not too bad. But then we get to game three against Detroit. Now, the Lions last year were just a couple plays away from their first ever Super Bowl. They're going to be incredibly hungry, and we're going to find out quickly if the Arizona defense is going to be up to the task against tight end Sam Laporta, who had a stellar rookie season in the Motor City. And it's always been a sore spot for the Cardinals, and I think it continues here. If the Cardinals don't get beat up by Laporta, you know it's going to be Jameer, Jameer Gibbs in the running game, David Montgomery on the ground, and of course, Amon Ross St. Brown through the air. There's just too many weapons for Detroit. And I think that's why they take down the Cardinals in a shootout where I 
where I predict there will be at least 53 total points scored. We'll have to see what the over-under action is for that week when we get there. The fourth and final game of the first block is against Washington. Arizona gets a look at the second overall pick, Jaden Daniels from LSU. And the Heisman winner should remind the Cardinals fans a lot of Kyler Murray. Got a pretty decent arm, but can also take off in the open field and make some plays too. So it's like, you know, seasoned Kyler against Rock, against a raw version of Kyler is what this game's going to be. For me, it comes down to depth. And I think Arizona has the deeper roster, 1 to 53, than Washington does. And they take the win here to avenge the loss in last year's opener. Look for the Arizona defense to come up with a couple of big plays like they did last year against the Commanders, including scoring the lone defensive touchdown of the season. And that did happen in week one at Washington on a fumble recovery after Sam Howell got sacked. So first four games in the books, two and two, not too bad. Could be better, could be worse, but, you know, we'd certainly take it with the way the schedule is laid out. Now the next four games are going to be against the 49ers, the Packers, the LA Chargers, and then the Miami Dolphins. So this is where it's going to start getting a little bit tough. All right, so you know, we yeah, jeans and takes on the 49ers at Levi's Field. You know, last year the 49ers made it to the Super Bowl and almost took down the Chiefs. But when it comes to the Cardinals, they always give Arizona a real tough time. In the series between the two teams, San Francisco has won each of the last four meetings by at least 16 points. The margin may not be that wide this year, but I won't be surprised if the 49ers win by double digits again and Arizona drops a two and three. But here's where it starts to get a little bit tricky. Week six, the Cardinals take on uh, Green Bay at Lambeau Field. These two teams have had some epic playoff games in the last 15 years, but the regular season is a different story. The Cardinals won their last trip to Lambeau back in December of 2018 on a, 20, a 2017 win with a late Zane Gonzalez field goal making the difference. This one could go either way, but I think Arizona pulls it out somehow, and they stand at 3-3 three and three after six games. I don't see the Packers' ground attack being the same with A.J. Dillon leading the charge after Aaron Jones went to Minnesota in the offseason. I think that's where they come up a little bit short, but I think Arizona's got just a little bit of a better team than what Green Bay does, at least right now. All right, so at 3-3 three and three going into Week 7, the big Monday night football game, Arizona hosts the Lightning McQueens, I mean the champions of the social media schedule releases, the L.A. Chargers. With a new coach and a revamped roster to get off salary cap hell, the Chargers have some question marks at running back with Gus Edwards there instead of Austin Eckler. Eckler went to Washington. And wide receiver with no more Keenan Allen, a cap casualty who went to the Bears for a fourth-round pick, nor Mike Williams. You know, and I played this game, I hit Sim to end, and I found Arizona with a win to make up for last time these two teams played a couple years ago. I don't want to remember the ending of that game either, and the Bird game makes better memories with a win on this one. If you don't remember the end of that game, the Chargers were a late touchdown, snuck in a two-point conversion, won by a point. Very disappointing outcome as Arizona did real well in that game and just couldn't finish. Now, it's also the lone primetime game this season. It's on Monday night as an ESPN Plus exclusive. Really? You guys think that low of the Cardinals to make them only ESPN Plus? Streaming only? Not even on the regular channel? Come on. By the way, the franchise is 15-26-1 all-time in 42 Monday night games. Just putting it out there. All right, so at 4-3, and three, the Cardinals pack their sunscreen head to Miami for a week eight day against the Dolphins. The question is, what's going to roast the Cardinals first? The afternoon sun in South Beach with the way the stadium is set up? Or the speed the Finns have in Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddell, Devin Shane? I don't think Arizona can keep up, and they hit the almost halfway point at 4-4. Four and four. The only good thing is it's also right after a Taylor Swift concert, so maybe if the guys get there a little bit early, maybe they can catch it. You never know. You know, the week before that is when Taylor Swift will actually be in Miami, so... It's going to be fast all around, and I, don't, and I don't think Arizona has the team speed to keep up with Miami, whether it be on the football field or for a concert. All right, next group of four games is where it gets even more interesting. So the third group of four has Arizona hosting Chicago on week nine, the Jets on week 10, the bye on week 11, and then you've got Arizona visiting Seattle on week 12, and the Cardinals at Minnesota on week 13. So when, when the Cardinals, you know, host Chicago, 
which is what I actually thought would be the first game of the season to have three top nine picks all make their debut at, on the same field at the same time. NFL didn't agree with me, by the way. The question that determines whether Arizona wins or not is whether or not the Bears offense with Caleb Williams under center comes together or not. You can't really keep Keenan Allen, DJ Moore, Roma Dunze, and Cole Komet all happy in the passing game. Or can you? I foresee Williams suffering from decision-making paralysis and the Arizona, the Arizona defense sacks him at least four times in a Cardinals win. By doing so, it puts, it, it puts the team at five and four going into that game against the Jets. Of course, on the other end of the spectrum, you have Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback of the Jets, who this season lasted not as long as this episode has before he tore his Achilles. You know, he's an old foe with some epic battles against the Cardinals, but now he's just old. The problem that the Cardinals are going to have with the Jets is named Brees Hall. Arizona's run defense was awful last year, and I can see Hall being a big problem for the Arizona defense this season. He can bowl you over and take off like a cyclone, but he can also devastate you in the passing game. And there's Garrett Wilson, too. And that was a team that Zach, with Zach Wilson at the helm, put up 30 on the Houston Texans last season in a driving rainstorm. If you want to be sneaky, the Jets' defense is also surprisingly tough and will give Arizona fits. I think the Jets take this one, and Arizona goes in the bye 5-5. Five and five. But at this point in the season, though, at the bye, they should be able to at least make a push to possibly contend for a playoff spot. They've already seen last season's win, win total, so they're playing with house money on this one. So week 12, the Cardinals go to Seattle. And when you go to Seattle, you always have to remember, A, Pike Place Market's fun. First Starbucks is up there. There's also the disgusting germ-infested gum wall. I'm not going to put a picture of it up because, well, I value you guys watching the show. But look at it on your own and try not to gag, wretch, whatever. But, yeah, it's just horrible. Um, you know, in the series, these two teams have found a lot of success on the road and nearly none at home for both teams. As far as I'm concerned, the trend continues, and Arizona finds a way to take another win out of Seattle We'll also take our lattes from the first Starbucks as the Cardinals beat the Rain City Bitch Pigeons. So we'll definitely take the win coming out of Seattle. We'll also take our lattes from Starbucks with uh, extra caramel in them. And the Cardinals ride off into the sunset at 6-5. and five. In week 13, the Cardinals are at Minnesota and the Vikings are going to pose some challenges. They've got a reasonable defensive side of the ball, but the offense does have question marks. At that point in the season, will it be Sam Darnold? or rookie and national champion, J.J. McCarthy under center. How will either quarterback fare trying to get the ball to Justin Jefferson to get him in his targets while getting Jordan Addison involved and former Packer running back Aaron Jones? The key is I don't think that stud tight end T.J. Hawkinson will be quite ready to come back after he tore his ACL late last season, especially if the Vikings are circling the drain and seeing their season head towards Valhalla. I think Arizona wins this one and is at seven to five as we hit the final five games of the season. So now it's crunch time. Cardinals actually could be in a good position here. What happens over the final five to really you know, determine their fate? So week 14 is that other game with Seattle, this time down here in the desert. We've all forgotten about the lame 6-6 tie game a few years back. But other than that, Seattle fares very well down here, and they always find a way to close, to close games out at the end just like DK Metcalf chasing down Buda Baker on an interception return. This one feels no different, and the Seahawks take this version of the DJ Dallas Bowl and continue to perform strongly down here in Arizona. Again, the road teams between these two win quite often. That's just the way it is. Now, Week 15 is fantasy playoff time, and it's where the Cardinals must pick up momentum. Arizona hosts the Patriots, and last season the Patriots looked like a hot mess. They couldn't run. They couldn't pass. At one point, they had Ezekiel Elliott carry the ball for him after Ramondre Stevenson got hurt. I mean, they looked really lost out on the field. Um, Patriots have a new coach in Jared Mayo, a new quarterback in Drake May, drafted third overall, and a receiving quarter that doesn't strike fear in anyone. You know, on the defensive side of the ball, there doesn't seem to be any standouts there either, and it feels like the Patriots are, ahead of, are going to end up with another top five pick again this year. Arizona should be one of the worst teams in the league by at least 10 points and get another win on the record. Of course, if you thought that was easy, we, hit the, we um, have it even easier the next week in week 16. 
because the Cardinals travel to Carolina and battle the Panthers, the only team in the NFL with no primetime games. They also still don't seem to have a quarterback in Bryce Young. Their receiving core seems to be okay on paper with Adam Thielen, Deontay Johnson, who was traded from Pittsburgh, and Xavier Leggett, amongst others. But the defense is going to let Carolina down. Just like the Jets from earlier, Carolina actually beat Houston last season in a 12-10 snoozer. But this is going to be a rude awakening from Big Red, and the Cardinals will roll all over the Panthers by at least two touchdowns. So we get to the final two games of the season. A lot of momentum going for them. And basically the last two games are a visit to the Rams and home finale against the 49ers. My gut feeling says the Rams find a way to pull that one out late season. Could be too much Kyron Williams. Could be Cooper Cup running amok in the, in the, in the secondary again. But I, I think the Rams find a way to make up for the for loss earlier in the season. They take the Cardinals down. And it basically puts everything on the finale against the 49ers. And that's a complete and utter toss-up. The Cardinals will be coming into that game 8-8. Eight and eight, And we don't know if San Francisco is going to have another solid season like they did last year. And they wrapped up the sole bye before the final game of the year. It could go either way. We don't know what's going to happen, obviously. But this will determine whether or not Arizona is perhaps 8-9 and nine or 9-8. Nine and eight. I mean, the Cardinals could have a lot to play for. But remember, only one team with fewer than 10 wins made the playoffs last year in the NFC, and that was Green Bay, who took the last spot at 9-8. and eight. Also, the Packers are the only team in either conference to make the postseason with fewer than 10 wins. So it should be a target for the team to shoot for. So, again, my prediction. You know, 9-8, and 8-9, eight, eight and nine, depending on what happens with the final game. The Green Bay game could go really either way. Don't have a real firm grip on that one. But overall, the key takeaway on this is improvement will happen for the Cardinals. They will look better next season. And they might contend for a playoff spot, depending on what the rest of the NFC does. But I really think going into 2025, this team should really be – you know, in the running for at least a wild card spot in 2025. Who knows? They might completely surprise us. All right, let's talk some fantasy now. So, you know, it's the end of May here. Fantasy drafts are maybe two to three months away, depending on your format. I mean, most redraft leagues get going in August, maybe September. But let's take a little time here and scout out what the Cardinals could look like from a fantasy perspective. So we start with Kyler Murray. I've got him as a borderline quarterback one with his with his rushing ability. I think that if he actually stays healthy and upright this season, he's going to be able to be kind of a, a solid pick. Not the most exciting pick, but at the end of the day in fantasy, it doesn't matter whether your quarterback's putting up the points when his team is up by seven points or down by 20. At the end of the day, points are points are points. And I think Kyler Murray is going to deliver – a quite a solid number this season. So I think he's on that QB1, QB2 borderline, trending a little more towards maybe like 10th or 11th best with the top 12 being QB1s, for example. You go to running backs, you look at James Conner, and I feel he's more of an RB2, possibly an RB3, like a, a flex play, driven by the volume and the lack of competition. I mean, keep in mind the Cardinals did pick up Trey Benson from Florida State at the draft, but beyond that, the other running backs of Michael Carter, Emery DiMarcado, don't really strike fear in anyone's heart, so it really feels like it's going to be Connor's backfield, especially in this, the final year of his contract. The thing about Connor is he had his first 1,000-yard season despite missing four games in the first half of the season with a leg injury, but it wasn't really until late in the year that Connor escalated his performance. The first four games, he was good and serviceable, but not great as he was in the final four. So I think, like I said, Connor's about an RB2 this season, maybe an RB3. Um, you, you get some solid weeks out of him. You'll have some weeks where he's just not really there just because of the game plan. But overall, you know, Connor is a, a decent depth piece to have on your roster. One that you really do want to have, though, is tight end Trey McBride. I can see him as definitely being a top five tight end this season, possibly making a run at the overall tight end one in fantasy. Yes, better than Mark Andrews. Yes, better than Travis Kelsey. Yes, better than everybody. 
Why? Because last year he led the team with more than 80 catches and had about 850 yards and has been showing himself to be a reliable safety valve for Kyler Murray. Now, when you've got the addition of Marvin Harrison Jr., who we'll talk about here in a second, that just opens up more room underneath for McBride to do his thing. And I think that he's going to really thrive and could possibly be the one of the first, if not the first Cardinal tight end to record a thousand yard uh, receiving season. It might actually happen. And I wouldn't be surprised if it did. Of course, the Cardinals have, have really not had any success with the tight end position before McBride. If I remember correctly, in roughly the 20 years uh, since Larry Fitzgerald was drafted, the Cardinals never had a tight end with more than 55 catches, 600 yards, or uh, five scores in a season at any point in those two decades. McBride shattered those numbers last season, and I think he's got more of a touchdown upside this year too. I think he's going to start really writing his name deeply in the Cardinals tight end record books starting this season. It will probably continue on for at least two or three more minimum. Now when you get to the wide receivers, you got Marvin Harrison Jr., who I have as a high-end wide receiver too based on his volume. I mean, there's no doubt he's going to get the targets. He's going to get the catches. He'll get the yardage easily. I can see uh, MHJ with 170-plus targets, 90-some catches, easily over 1,000 yards barring injury. But I, I just want to see how he um, how he adapts to the NFL level of competition before I'm ready to completely crown him a wide receiver one. Is he going to be there? Yes. Is he going to be in contention? Yes. But at the end of the day, you still have to have about 1,250 yards to make wide receiver one in terms of yardage. And I don't necessarily know if he can get there, but over 1,000, I'd bank on it right now. Absolutely. So he's definitely going to be a solid pick, but just don't fall into the early ADP that you're seeing now. At this time of year, if you're drafting you know, here in May or June, because the rookie drafts have blown up the ADP on him significantly. Think about it a little bit longer in a redraft format and look at that ADP later this summer in about two months to really get a good feel for it. The other wide receivers are Michael Wilson, Greg Dortch. I see both as wide receiver fours in fantasy. Fun to own if you like the Cardinals, but I wouldn't really, wouldn't really rely on them too much. Might be a bye week fill in here and there, but other than that, not really worth rostering. The recently signed Zay Jones doesn't show much better as a wide receiver three. Again, he's probably going to be the second option at the wide receiver position, third option in the offense. And those kind of players don't really do a whole lot for me in terms of fantasy football. So, again, take Zay if you want. Leave him on the pine. Don't be surprised if you wind up cutting him three or four games into the season to make room for somebody else who can do better. But I just don't see the value happening for him as of right now, but you never know how that could change if someone were to get hurt or something went a little awry. But overall, I'm not terribly big on Zay Jones. Finally, here you've got Matt Prater, the kicker in the Arizona defense. They're best left undrafted, but look for them around the Cardinals by week as possible late season stashes. Reason being that easy schedule, um, that relatively easy schedule after the bye, especially when the Cardinals play New England and Carolina during two of the playoff weeks, those could be really solid weeks for the defense, and it could also be really good weeks for Matt Prater to do some kicking and score some extra points for your team as well. It be that little difference maker get you to um, get you over the hump into the winner's circle. As always, check your league rules and scoring settings before making any move. The Cardinals look like a team that can be counted on to produce in fantasy with its three key players in the passing game. And again, Marvin Harrison Jr. will get a ton of volume, and he will put up solid rookie numbers as we go through the season. If you had, if I had to put a number on it, I would say approximately 1,173 yards is the number I'm targeting for him. 1173. Don't know how I came up with that, but I can see him being about. 85 catches, 1,173 yards, eight touchdowns. We'll check that in January and see how close I was, but you never know. But speaking of Marvin and Harris, speaking of MHJ, and last but not least tonight, we have 
the lawsuit. When Marvin Harrison Jr. was sued by Fanatics for a potential breach of contract, saw a streak of episodes with a lawsuit in them surrounding this team is still intact. Yay, I guess. Fanatics claimed they had a deal with Harrison going back to his college days at Ohio State. Harrison Jr. says it never happened. We'll have updates on this case as they come in, but it still means we're not able to buy his number 18 jersey until this is resolved. And, hey, I mean, jersey looks sharp. I'd like to see, you know, I actually have to get one for myself, but because of this, I can't do it. Neither can you. Nobody can. And it's really just, you know, super disappointing. Well, next time on Cardinals Uncovered, we'll take a look back at the rookie minicamp, OTAs, and see how the rookies are faring, as well as all the other news, notes, and happenings as we work towards minicamp next month. And think about it. Eight weeks from now, it's the start of training camp. It's coming. It's coming very soon. But that's it for now. We'll talk to you next time on Cardinals Uncovered.